Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us today as we are starting a brand new series, and it's simply called I Am. Now, these two words are actually quite useful and powerful at the same time, and we all probably use them relatively frequently every day, as in I am hungry, or I am thirsty, or I am tired. So it can be used to describe your physical state, and we often do. However, you can also use it to describe your emotional state of mind, as in I am worried, or I am sad, or I am really upset about this or that. And although we use it in this way, I think it's totally underutilized when it comes to emotions, and we often bottle them up instead of sharing it. But that really is a topic for another day and not the focus of this series. However, these two ways in which we use the I am statement is not all either. We often use it to communicate something of our identity and how we see ourselves. For instance, we will introduce ourselves by saying, I am, and then you will say your name. Or if you want to let someone know by which set of values your life is governed, you will say something like, I am a Jesus follower, or I am a runner. So how people complete the statement, I am, will often tell you a lot about them and how they see themselves. Now, if you are a Marvel or an Avengers fan, you will probably recognize some very significant and extremely iconic words that started with these two words and illustrates this confirmation of identity very well. It comes from the movie Avengers Endgame. And all the Marvel fans can say it with me, I am Iron Man. And then he clicked his fingers. Don't worry if you didn't quite understand that reference. Just ask any Avengers fan and they'd be happy to explain it to you. The point is that these words are pretty powerful and can be used in an array of different ways. Yet, it has also been the source of much debate and philosophizing over the centuries. Because the implicit question in that statement is, what constitutes our identity? leading to profound statements like René Descartes' famous words, I think, therefore, I am. And these words were so profound that it led to the Enlightenment and actually forms the basis of our Western worldview. We see ourselves as rational, logical beings. And the mere fact that we can think confirms our existence and our identity. Meanwhile, in another part of the world, in Africa, a radically different worldview to presidents. To them, it wasn't your rationality that confirmed your identity, but rather your community. And so they said instead, we are, therefore, I am. Or how it's often stated, I am because we are. And this way of thinking is known as Ubuntu, meaning that no one exists in isolation. And friends, I think if there was ever a time to remember this statement, it is right now. I told you last week that the issues I'm dealing with on a daily basis in my pastoral practice is just getting heavier and more frequent the longer people are isolated from one another and the longer they are limited in their interaction with their surrounding community. Friends, it all comes down to the fact that these two words are really important and how you see yourself will have a massive impact on the way you live your life. A big part of the work I do with people is around their identity, who they are and how they see themselves. If you see yourself as a failure, that will have a massive impact on your behavior. And you will most probably have a defeatist attitude at the slightest opposition. However, if you believe you are more than a conqueror, it will change the way you approach any challenge in life. And because of this, I'm absolutely convinced that there is nothing that can change your life more significantly than discovering your identity in Christ. Knowing who you are simply because you belong to Him. Therefore, I would say that if you really want to know who you are, you've got to start by knowing who God is. In fact, if I want to continue in the same vein as René Descartes and the wisdom of Ubuntu, I would say, God is, therefore, I am meaning that it is in God that we can truly discover who we are. And therefore, this series is not first and foremost about your identity, although it will be the implication and application of it. In the first place, this series is about discovering who God is, and more specifically, 
how he revealed himself to us through Jesus. Because in the end, that is where the power will come from to help you live life to the full. So, if you've landed here by mistake, or if you're listening to this because you're interested in knowing more about God and Jesus, but haven't quite taken a step of faith yet, this is the right place for you. However, if you have been following Jesus all your life, this is also the right place for you. Because my hope and my prayer is that we will all get to know God better as we look closer at this simple statement, I am, when He uses it. It's one thing to hear what others say about God. It is totally something else when you listen to what He says about Himself. In Habakkuk 3, we read this, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known. Therefore, it is my prayer that you may all experience him for yourselves as you listen to how he uses these two simple words over the next few weeks. And may it help you to also realize who you are. Because he is the one who created you, who shaped you, and who came to redeem you. So let's start with a story from the Hebrew Scriptures, what we know as the Old Testament. So the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, chose to reveal himself to a guy by the name of Abraham. And he promised that he would make him into a great nation and that the whole earth would be blessed through him. God also confirmed this promise to Abraham's son, Isaac, and his grandson, Jacob, who was later known as Israel. Now, during Jacob's lifetime, there was a terrible famine in his country. And they all went to Egypt to escape the food shortages. And his family ended up staying there for 400 years. And you'd be surprised how they accumulated that during that time. He started out with 12 sons, and of the 400 years, they were so many that they weren't called families anymore. They were now 12 tribes of the nation Israel. Anyway, during this time, the Egyptians saw how much this nation grew. And they were scared that they might overthrow them and take their country. And so they enslaved them and made life really difficult for these people. Amongst other measures to contain the rapid growth of this nation, they introduced a law to kill all the Israelites' baby boys. This was terrible. However, some of them escaped, like the little boy Moses, who ended up growing up in the Pharaoh's palace. It's a fascinating story, and I'm skipping over a lot of details in order to get to the main part I want to talk about. But I do recommend that you go and you read the whole story for yourselves. Anyway, when Moses was 40 years old, He saw the oppression of his people firsthand, and he tried to intervene. But he went a little bit too far, killing an Egyptian in the process. And in the end, he had to flee for his life, and ended up in the desert, where he got married and raised his own family. And he lived there for another 40 years, until he was an old man of 80. And at that age, he was walking in the field one day, when he saw something curious, A bush that was on fire, but wasn't consumed by the flames. And then this happened in Exodus 3. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. So here are two words again. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. So God introduced himself with these two words, I am. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? What I find fascinating here is that when you come face to face with God, when he reveals himself to you, the next response usually has to do with your own identity. God says, I am. And Moses responds with, 
Who am I? It immediately makes you wonder about yourself. And what God does next is also quite profound because he doesn't respond in what we would think is an appropriate answer to that question of Moses. He doesn't say, well, Moses, uh, you have a lot of potential in you. You were actually the strongest candidate for a job because I saw how passionate you were 40 years ago to save your people. And I think you do really well in this task I've got for you. No, God simply said in verse 12, I will be with you. He didn't start with Moses' identity. He started with his identity because that changes everything. In other words, Moses, it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter that you've lived in total obscurity for the last 40 years in the middle of the desert when I am with you. That supersedes anything else. That is what will constitute your identity. It doesn't matter who you are right now. What matters is who I am. And that when I am with you, it will change your identity and it will change your whole life. Friends, that is true for us as well. But Moses was still a bit skeptical after this encounter. And he didn't really want this task. So he said, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? Now, there are probably a few reasons why Moses is asking this question. First of all, although he's hearing God speak, he cannot see him or touch him. He knows he's real, but he doesn't have any tangible evidence for it. And so he wants to know who he is speaking to. Secondly, he knows that if he were to go back, not saying that he would, but if he were to commit to this, Some people may remember his colorful background and how he killed a man. And now suddenly he was there to lead these people. And this may be frowned upon to say the least. They may ask him quite directly, Who made you our leader? Why should we follow you? To be honest, when he was 40 years younger, he tried to fight the oppression of his people and he failed miserably. What are the chances that he would now succeed when he is so much older? And so he knows that he cannot do this on his own. He will need some credentials to back up what he's suggesting. And thirdly, they lived in a world where people believed in a whole myriad of gods and goddesses. And so Moses was wondering which one he was actually talking to, because he had to be able to tell the Israelites who sent him. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Friends, This is an incredibly powerful statement for several reasons. First of all, it can actually be translated in several ways. As it's in the imperfect tense in Hebrew, the I am can literally be translated with I am, I was, or I will be. And so this phrase could be translated in nine different ways. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be, or I was who I was, or I was who I will be, and and so forth. The point is that there is something eternal in nature that's being communicated through this statement. And his next sentence confirms it. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God is saying that even if you knew nothing else of him, know this. God is and therefore you are. He is the creator of everything. He was there in the past. He is with us in our present circumstances and he will be with us in the future. God is and there's no denying it. His name tells us that we never have to wonder about his existence. You never have to wonder if God is still around. If you wonder, he says, I am. Stop your doubt. Stop your wondering. God is. Right throughout the Bible, you will encounter that God is the great I am. He's ever-present. His existence is never questioned. In fact, the only places in the Bible where there are references to people who do not believe in the existence of God is to make it clear that they are fools. The question is never whether there is a God or not. The question of the Bible is, who is this God? What is he like? And throughout the Bible, God constantly revealed himself to his people. In fact, I would say that a point of the Exodus story that we read in the rest of this book 
is not just for God to intervene in his people's lives and rescue them, but actually to redeem them through their relationship with him. It's to show them who he is so that they can discover who they really are, his people. In the second place, when God reveals himself as the great I am, it is quite reassuring because it goes right to the heart of what Moses must have been feeling. He was worried about going back to his people. He was scared that he would fail again or that the people would not accept him or even believe him. It was an incredibly daunting task and more than a name, Moses was looking for reassurance. And a few verses earlier, God actually already promised that he would be with Moses. And now he confirmed it. It was like he was saying, I hear you, Moses. I see you. I understand you and I care about you. You want reassurance? I am that reassurance. You will not be alone. In the third place, this name tells us that God is limitless. In fact, whenever we use the term I am, it invariably limits us, no matter how we finish the sentence. For instance, if I say I am a man, it immediately limits me in the sense that I'm not a woman. If I say I'm in my 40s, it immediately limits me from being in my 30s or in my 20s. However, when God uses it, it doesn't limit him at all because he stops with I am. In other words, he cannot be contained. He's so much more than whatever label you want to attach to him. And even though we can describe certain of his characteristics, like God is love, or God is faithful, or God is just, he is infinitely more than that. So when he speaks about himself, he simply says, I am. Now that's radically different than anything or anyone else. And if you ever wanted to use the word holy, this is the time to do it. Because God is just so much more and so much bigger than anything else we could ever fathom. In fact, the Hebrew word for I am became God's first name in the Bible. He was called Yahweh. But people never said that out loud because the name itself was holy to them. They would read a text and suddenly God's name would appear. And instead of reading Yahweh that was written, then they would say Adonai or Elohim instead. Because to even just say it out loud was considered blasphemous and not something any respectful Jew would ever do. However, fast forward about 1300 years and we meet Jesus. The religious leaders weren't very fond of him and they kept on getting into arguments with him. And according to them, he was a troublemaker. And one day things got really heated in one of their arguments. Because they were going on about how special they were because they descended from Abraham. And Jesus was saying that they weren't very much like Abraham. And this really upset them. But then he went a step further and said in John 8, Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. The people said, You aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you've seen Abraham? And then Jesus dropped the bombshell. I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. Now this sounds grammatically incorrect, but it is exactly how it was meant to sound. In fact, we often miss the meaning and the impact of these words, but his audience didn't. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. They immediately realized that Jesus was saying that he is indeed God. He is the great I am. And so friends, if you want to know who you are, if you want to experience life to the full, I want to invite you to get to know him better. In Hebrews 1, we read this. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now, in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. And his name is Jesus. And over the next few weeks, we are going to look at how Jesus revealed himself to us by using the words, I am. There are seven specific statements he made, starting with these words. And we're going to look at each one to see what we can learn about him and about us through that. And so as we go on this journey together, remember that when God shared his name with us, he was saying that he is the eternal everlasting God who cannot be limited by anything or anyone, 
that he is indeed holy, but at the same time, he cares about us and reassures us that he hears our cries for help and he will be with us no matter what we're facing. And therefore, I want to encourage you to spend time with him, to get to know him better and to learn to trust him more because it is only in him that you will find your true identity. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you chose to reveal yourself to your people. Please help us to get to know you better and to recognize you more. Lord, I want to pray for everyone who sometimes struggle with their identity and who they are. Please help them to discover who they are in you. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Please receive God's blessing and remember that God is and he promised to be with you no matter what. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.